a reading from 1 Corinthians. Stop passing judgment before the time of the Lord's return. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and manifest the intentions of hearts. At that time, everyone will receive his praise from God. From the beginning of time, from the dawn of creation, we hear a separation of light and darkness. When we think of light, we think of God. We think of things that can be seen. We think of clarity. We think of the path that we can walk. When we think of darkness, we tend to think of the evil one, things that are hidden, difficulty to see where we're going, evil, sin. And our Lord in today's reading says he comes to reveal, to manifest the intentions of our hearts. He comes to bring light in a very gentle and caring way, light that is warm, light that is a gentle glow, almost like the beginning of the dawning of a day it comes in ever so gently and quietly, and little by little, the darkness disappears, and it gives way to light, to God, to goodness, to truth. And so God comes to reveal what's in our hearts, what is hidden that needs to be brought to light, what is secret that needs to be known? What is wounded that needs to be healed? God focuses on the heart because our heart is the place of intimacy for God. He doesn't choose the mind because our minds are filled with deception. They're numb. They're clouded with reality. And so God chooses an intimate place to dwell among us, to dwell inside of us. Again, creator of the heavens, creator of the earth that cannot be contained in time. Nothing can contain God. And then our loving God humbles himself, lowers himself, makes himself so small so that he can dwell inside of us. And he chooses to bring light in order to manifest what is occupying the space that belongs to God. As God says, I want intimacy with you. I want to love you. And I want to be loved by you in totality. I hold nothing back from you. I don't want you to hold nothing back from me. The one who is love, the one who is the essence of love, the one who is the lover of our hearts and our souls wants 
to love and to be love. So he comes to reveal intimacy with us. God wants to reveal himself to us. God literally wants to touch us in a way that it might seem physical for us. But remember the word touch also means to move. God wants to move our hearts in the direction that draws us closer to him. And we could see moments throughout salvation history that are moments of deep, divine, and personal intimacy. We see this with Jesus so many times. And I'm sure if we wanted to go through an opportunity to go through Scripture, all of us would have such a list of all the ways that Jesus manifested divine intimacy with us. And he moved people's hearts, and they rejoice that they were restored in the dignity they were created in. For a moment, think of when he raised Lazarus from the dead, how they were all filled with sorrow. Jesus in divine intimacy touches his friend Lazarus and brings him back to life as almost he was massaging his heart and breathing life back into him very intimate moment, and it transforms everyone's belief in the resurrection that we hear their hearts are moved. How about the woman at the well who felt probably despicable to the point that she couldn't be seen? She had to come to the well at the time where no one else would come at the heat of the day and Jesus' words move her heart. Just simply his words of speaking truth to her bring light into those dark places in her heart, and he moves her, and she moves a whole town to believe in who Jesus is. How about the woman who comes to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and to dry his feet with her hair. What a beautiful moment of intimacy with God. What a beautiful way that she touches God and God touches her and he restores her in dignity. Or the woman who said, if I just touch his tassel, I will be healed. And we hear that power leaves Jesus. From his heart, power goes into this woman, and it heals her. What a moment of divine intimacy. And we can go on and on and on through Scripture of everyone Jesus touched. There were physical healings, we hear. We know that physically sight was restored. The mute were able to speak. Those who couldn't hear were able to hear. Lepers were cleansed. We know that there were physical healings, that Jesus touched them physically, but it was the interior. It is what happened on the inside, that he brings light and he reveals himself, and their hearts are moved and they are transformed from the inside out. Two of the most profound moments of divine intimacy in Scripture is perhaps creation in itself, where we have this image of the potter and the clay, that the potter takes the clay and gently begins to form it to move it, to stroke it, to massage it, ever so gently bringing it form, bringing it meaning, 
as the clay on the wheel is caressed in the Creator's hands, that God creates in that intimacy. It's so personal. And then He breathes His very essence into His creature so that they can be one. He gives breath of Himself. He touches the creature from the very beginning so that the two can be one. He places his very essence in that creature's soul, animating it to life so that now these two can become one for all eternity. How beautiful is that moment that God touches all creation and brings life when he says, let there be light. The second, perhaps, most profound moment of divine intimacy is the Annunciation. God wanting to manifest the intentions of His heart. He wants to reveal the intention of His heart and simply to love is what He wants to do. That when we look at the Annunciation, this is God wanting to reveal Himself, to give His heart to His creature. In totality, He just wants to give Himself so that what was separated from sin and darkness can be reunited in light and love. And so God wants to touch His creature. God wants to be in his creature. God wants his creature to be united to him so he becomes the creature. He becomes that what he created. How more intimate can you be where God gives himself so that he can pour himself once again like water into his beautiful creature, beautiful moment of intimacy. And can you imagine for a moment Mary's heart at the moment that God overshadowed her with his love? He overshadows her with his glory. Imagine the profound intimacy of this moment that it gives life. It causes creation. The Word is made flesh, the incarnation. Imagine the profound love of this moment. I think and dare to say that at this moment, all of God's love, every inch of God's love, every ounce of God's love is poured into this moment of the Annunciation because God gives himself in totality. It's all love, pure love, the essence of love. God is so vulnerable at this moment, he gives all his heart to Mary and humanity. His sacred heart begins to beat in the heart of Mary. And these two hearts become one. They're inseparable. They can never be separated. And if this moment is the most profound moment of love, the second moment would be Jesus in his agony of the garden, where Mary receives all light and glory at the agony Jesus shows us all the filth and all the sin and all the wretchedness of every human being from the beginning of time, Jesus suffers in his heart. And his mother shows him profound love when she receives him into her body. And now Jesus does the same. It takes great love to overcome all that sin and wretchedness from the beginning of the first sin and the fall 
from grace. So Jesus learns divine intimacy from his mother. And we could learn divine intimacy from the Holy Family as well. The Holy Family of Nazareth for us is a school of love. We need to be homeschooled in the school of love that teaches us that God wants nothing more than to love us, but it teaches us how to respond to divine intimacy. Mary shows us how to do that. I remember one time when I was in my private chapel and I was praying in the presence of Jesus in the tabernacle. And as I'm praying through the liturgy of the hours, I find myself in a moment of simply knowing that God all of a sudden is present. God comes down in a profound way and I know it. And perhaps we know these moments when we say the hair on our arms stand up. You know that moment. There's a moment that you just know that something beyond us is moving us. And I know this moment. And the first thing that I do is I hide. I run behind my chair and I literally crawl in hiding because I know God is there. I have a vision of being in Eden. And this is what Adam is. I feel just like Adam. God calling out, Ivan, Ivan, where are you? I almost wanted to scream out like Adam. I heard you walking in the garden, but I hid because I was afraid. I was so concerned of being in the presence of God, divine intimacy, because of my sinfulness. And God says, why are you hiding? Why are you hiding? And I don't have an answer for him. And he also, if we remember, replied for Adam to make sure that Adam didn't sin again by lying to God. And before I could respond, God responded for me. He said in a question, didn't I forgive you? Haven't I forgiven you all your sins? And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, come out. Let me see you. And I came out from under the chair. And this is a moment of divine intimacy where we are transparent. God could see right through us, light that comes beaming right into all the darkness of our mind, our body, our heart, our soul, our strength, our spirit. God sees right through us. He sees right through me. No hiding at all. And the question that he asks is, yes, Lord, you have forgiven me then let me see you. It is a moment where God just wants to gaze upon us in all his beauty, in all our beauty. It's a spiritual nakedness where God reveals the intentions of our hearts and God makes us feel as we ought to feel. And that is beautiful in his presence. I didn't know how to respond to this moment of intimacy, but Mary and Joseph do. So we go into the home school of Nazareth, and what can we learn from these two? Well, the first thing is, as beloved children, they teach us how to respond to God. Simply, they remain obedient to the divine will. They say yes to God and no to their own will, no to their own intentions. They simply, as children who trust, who are vulnerable, who believe in their parents, simply do that to God. 
and they show Jesus how to do the same thing. We hear the Father says, this is my beloved Son. Jesus would have learned that from Mary and Joseph. And then it reminds us that in order for us to be spouses, we need to learn how to be beloved children first and then we can be beloved spouses. And Mary and Joseph show that again to Jesus as Jesus becomes the bridegroom and his bride, Holy Mother Church. And they show him how to be spouse, to give themselves as the Trinity gives itself in relation one to the other. Mary and Joseph teach us to do the same thing, to give ourselves in totality, to remove from ourselves anything that's disordered, to remove ambition, to remove competition, is simply to know how to love one another the way God has loved us. And they taught that to Jesus that Jesus loved his bride, we hear, so much that he lays down his life for her. He gives himself in totality to his bride. We can learn that as well, to simply give ourselves, to lay it all down for the lover who simply wants to love us. And then ultimately, we can't be good parents until we learn to be good spouses and good beloved children of God. And so we know that as parents, we know that they took care of Jesus. This is a profound mystery for us, that God would have taught Joseph the source of all fatherhood, and God would have taught Mary the source of all motherhood. And God, in his profound love for all humanity, gives his son to Mary and Joseph. Most profound mystery. And they teach Jesus the same thing. And Jesus, we know, becomes the good shepherd for us. We know one of the images that we hear of the church is Jesus is the good pelican. What a beautiful image from motherhood for us that we hear when the chicks of a pelican are starving, that when they're hungry, when they're faint because there's no food, that the mother pelican strikes her breast she literally wounds herself in order to give her blood and her flesh to her chicks in order that they may live and be resurrected again. What a beautiful image of motherhood for Jesus. That Jesus does that. His side is open for us. And we, the beloved children, are fed from his side, his precious body and blood. And from Joseph, we see that he is the good shepherd who always takes care of his flock, always protecting them, always guiding them as a father always does. Jesus learns all this in the school of Nazareth, how to become a beloved child, how to have that spousal relationship with the church, his bride, and also how to be parent to all of God's children. Jesus, in turn, shows this to us. He shows his disciples, all of us, how to be those beloved children by simply being obedient to God in all things. In that spousal relationship, he shows us to give ourselves always in love for the other. And ultimately, as a parent, 
he shows us great love, great mercy. He's always so forgiving, slow to anger, quick to heal. And all that is divine intimacy. God literally touching each and every single one of us through the Holy Family. And we can go on in those moments in the Mass, in the sacraments, in Scripture, all moments of divine intimacy. So as we conclude this beautiful Advent season, I thank all of you for being in this season and allowing it to be a season of prayer in preparation, yes, for the second coming, but now in a particular way for Christmas and the Nativity, where God once again gives himself in total love, in love, through love, with love, for love. This child that comes to us wants divine intimacy. That since when we were enemies of God, as Scripture says, we were unable to be with God, but in divine intimacy, God gives himself. And now what God wants is as a child, he wants us to pick him up. He wants us to embrace him. He wants us to hold him, to bring him close to our own hearts so that once again, the light of Christ can reveal the stuff that is hidden in our hearts, the hidden attentions, and that he can manifest it and reveal himself to us in a gentle light so that we can receive this love and truly become what we were meant to be, God's pure love.